Hello, welcome back to another Evolutionary Astrology Zoom meeting. Today is June 28th, 19, wait now, 2018. <laughs> this is Neptune and Capricorn Generation. Uh, I'm your host today, speaker Bradley Nerrigan. Uh, many thanks to everyone at the EA Zoom group here who's keeping this going. Uh, I'm really thankful to be here again today and and talk with you all so um <laughs> neptune generations right it's kind of a funny idea um uh, when i think about it because um i never really talk about it actually um i haven't but um I've talked a lot about pluto generations and uh if you're into evolutionary astrology you've probably also talked about the pluto generations right um um, so yeah, what about those Pluto and Leos in their glory days today? Um, we're very familiar, also known as the baby boomers, more or less. Um, I kind of think of that generation a lot right now because um, Pluto's in Capricorn and it's making that in conjunct. And and with Pluto and Capricorn, I, I think that you know it, it's all those souls are reminded about, you know, the limitations of time left in their lives and their bodies. Um, and so that in conjunct really is a kind of a classic crisis for, for the, for our, for our Pluto Leo souls out there. Uh, however, they, they, they're still, they're still shining strong, um, for better and, and, and for worse. Um, oh yeah. Um, and I see, yeah, and I almost skipped over the Pluto Virgo slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Pluto Virgos. Uh, I feel like you're still kind of in the shadows of um, Pluto Leo's still but, but doing all the work <laughs> uh, and uh, just Pluto Libras just out there doing our thing I, I, sometimes I think the Pluto Libras are even like um, a big reason why like um, there's so much um, like sharing uh, on social media that that generation really brought forward a lot of that uh, and the, the Pluto Scorpio generation, uh, you know, and, and we're going to get into this a little bit is, is, is very much aligned with the Neptune and Capricorn generation, but uh, we're going to talk about how it's um, a bit different than just Pluto and Scorpio, which, which does make up uh, most of it. Got our Pluto and Sag is coming up. Um, I kind of still think that they're going to revolutionize education here. I look forward to that. Maybe when Pluto goes into Aquarius. <laughs> So um, Neptune generations uh, and and Neptune and Capricorn. I think of Neptune and Capricorn, and you know I always kind of think of like a sandcastle if I think of like Saturn and in, in Pisces or or Neptune and Capricorn, right? So there's this the dissolving piece, and, and it's like time really does dissolve all, and time is Capricorn, but um, Neptune correlates with dissolving. And, and timelessness also. Um, so there's a little bit of a paradox too of, of combining this timelessness with time. Um, and, uh, you know, um, capitalism is, is one correlation to Capricorn. Um, so I was thinking how, um, you know, Neptune and Capricorn in a chart could be uh, someone who idealizes capitalism as an economic model. That's, that's entirely possible. Uh, it can be someone who uh, dreams of nationalism. That's entirely possible. Someone who loves boundaries and separation. It's possible. <laughs> we don't think of it a lot with this generation, but is it there? Uh, so there, there's these chapters in the Neptune and Capricorn generation um, I'm going to talk about those chapters a lot. Uh, I know today that I think millennials is probably the, the more common term for this generation. Uh, but I do remember that back in the day, it was really popular in the, in the new age circles with the uh, referring to them as the indigo children. And, um, if I remember it correctly, it's really that, that Uranus, when Uranus joined in, and we had this Uranus-Neptune conjunction in Capricorn, 
um, in the early 90s that that was that was part of this uh, and and there's definitely truth to that uh, there's lots of lot of special souls in this generation um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit and those souls um, and some of their gifts and challenges and I'm also going to talk about you know the flip side of this and 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 some of the other correlations and some of the other souls and part of this generation that maybe we don't think about that much. Um, and so, yeah, this whole idea that um, maybe we looked initially uh, through rose colored glasses at this generation with, with hopes of, of, of what they might be. Uh, they are millennials. I, and I have this, I thought this was clever, but maybe it's not that clever. <laughs> Instead of indigo children in the go, generation because uh, really i mean they they're coming in at a time where everything time itself is accelerated and everything is is quickening pace of life and and the connection the you can go from point a to point b across the globe uh, physically or in communication and that just wasn't possible um, in my generation or generations before me were growing up. So um, in, Neptune, of course, correlates in evolutionary astrology with consciousness and, and our ideals within consciousness, right? And so that's what I'm saying is that there's so many possibilities of what could be ideal within someone's consciousness. So how do you even begin? Um, so I thought maybe I would start with the timeline of of Neptune going through Capricorn. Um, but this I thought, you know, actually this isn't gonna work and maybe we need some kind of graphic, something conceptual here to help us. And I thought, I thought of how this is actually like a sandwich um, when, when Neptune goes through Capricorn. Um, and it's kind of like, I call it a Sagi Cap sandwich because um, there's a strong Sagittarius element to the early part and there's a strong Sagittarius element to the, to the later part of the generation. And the middle part has a very strong emphasis on, on Capricorn. Um, but, but maybe it's more like a burger. And actually, I don't, I think I had a really good ice cream sandwich the other day. <laughs> and so I decided to go with this ice cream sandwich graphic. It's really silly. Um, but, uh, okay, so here's Neptune going into the, to the ice cream sandwich. This is like, this is 1984 at the start of this generation. <laughs> and, and you can see I've got, uh, at the time, Uranus was in Sagittarius. So that there's, there's, a, there's a Sagittarius emphasis here. And um, Pluto's in Scorpio for, like I said, most, most of this generation. Um, and then at that, at that entry point, Saturn was in Scorpio. So Uranus, of course, is 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 progressing, right? And so we have the Uranus and Sag, and then Uranus goes into Capricorn. Um, but before that happened, we had Saturn go into Sagittarius, and and this was this was this was pretty famous in 1988. Uh, maybe maybe some of you are very very familiar. Remember this. We had these conjunctions of of Saturn and Uranus at the end of Sagittarius, really close to the galactic center, and and, and there were three of them, and and there was there was one in early '88, I, I believe, and then they um, then they they go into Capricorn, then they retrograde into Sagittarius, and then they have two and three in Sagittarius. They finish up their little Sagittarius thing, and then suddenly we have a lot of planets in Capricorn. Uh, November 85 was the, um, Saturn went into Sagittarius. So for those early part of the generation, when, when Saturn went into Sagittarius, you know, we, we definitely have this from November 88 through those 1988 conjunctions. There's a really heavy Sagittarius emphasis for having Neptune in Capricorn. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, like I said, it started in 84, and, and of course, Neptune does the dip in, goes back out, comes back in, so, um, and, and then we have, 
you know, a lot of Capricorn. I mean, Saturn, Uranus, and, and Neptune and Cap. The, it's a really interesting time. Uh, to me, uh, 89 to 93 is a very fascinating time. And I think that there's going to be a lot more written about this and, and studied and coming out about it. I believe that we were, we've been too close to it having just happened. And, and when we get further into the, you know, this century further in time, we'll be able to look back and have more perspective and, and, and realize how, how pivotal that time was. Um, so uh, 93 was the, the Uranus Neptune conjunctions. Um, and, and, you know, really, I mean, if you think about it, the, the 60s, which uh, are talked about so much with this Uranus-Pluto conjunction in, in Virgo, right? And this was the next real big thing was this 1993, early 90s, because cause before 93, Saturn was right there uh, with Uranus and then reaching Neptune. And then Saturn was with Neptune before, before Uranus was in 93. So a whole period there. Um, this was the next big thing. Pluto in 95 goes into Sagittarius, but we've got some time still where Neptune is, is, is still going through. And, and then at the end, um, after the conjunctions with Uranus and Neptune, Uranus goes into Aquarius. So, so the end of this generation is a very different flavor from all this heavy concentration of Capricorn, you know, Pluto and Sag, Uranus and Aquarius, right? So it's kind of a throwback a little bit to, to, the, to the earlier part of the generation. So you see what I'm saying, how there's a little bit of that sandwich there. Uh, and well, Saturn kept cruising. So, so there's that. Um, <laughs> and then in 98, Neptune makes its entry into Aquarius and then dips back in and goes in. So that happened. Um, so I'm gonna kind of plow through a little recap uh, of what you just saw. Um, and, and maybe this is helpful, maybe not, so I'll see. <laughs> uh, a little more dates. So it was January 84 that Neptune went into Capricorn and, and um, Saturn in November 85 went into Sagittarius right? December 1987, that was um, Saturn and Uranus are in a bals almost like this balsamic conjunction in Sagittarius. But then in February 12th, 1988, uh, so this is interesting, okay, February 12th, 88, there's the first of the Saturn-Uranus conjunctions. And the very next day, Saturn goes into Capricorn. And then the very next day after that, Uranus goes into Capricorn. Uh, so it's really interesting, but then they both go backwards. Um, and then we have, uh, the second conjunction in Sag and then the third conjunction, which was really the third conjunction, October 18th, 1988 was really close to the galactic center. Uh, and then we got the re-entry into Capricorn. And then, uh, so basically at the end of 88, beginning of 99, we have beginning of this little mini era where there's just a lot of Capricorn. Uh, and I'll show you some charts too uh, that, that have a lot of Capricorn. <laughs> and, so, and people were born on these days. Uh, <laughs> so um, the Saturn-Neptune conjunction, uh, we have first one here on March 2nd, 89. The second was June 23rd, 89. And then November 12th, 89, we have the third Saturn-Neptune conjunction. Um, this, so the, and in my mind, of course, I've, I've always kind of thought of how the World Wide Web began right around this time. Um, and so based on my research, um, December 1990 to January 91 is kind of a little two month window that marks the start of the World Wide Web. Um, and Saturn pops into Aquarius there, February 91. Um, April 91, Saturn and Neptune are almost in conjunction. Um, and in April 92, they're 
so close to a conjunction, but then they don't. And then February 93, we have our first Uranus-Neptune conjunction. August 20th, 93, there's the second Neptune-Uranus conjunction. And uh, October 25th is the third. So those are all like 18, 19 cap, you can see there. Um, and then um, Pluto goes into Sagittarius. And so we like, have this later period where Pluto's in Sag, Neptune's still in Capricorn. And January 96, Uranus enters Aquarius. And so the end of the Neptune Capricorns are very different. Um, uh, so August, I'm sorry, uh, November 26th, 1998, that was the final departure of Neptune and Capricorn. Um, this chart here is, um, this was one of the Uranus-Saturn conjunctions in Sag. So near, near the galactic center. And um, I, I put it up because, I mean, the moon's right there, Mercury's right there, the sun's right there. Yeah, and um, it's not exact yet, but I mean, just look at that, that mass of Sagittarius. It's, it's pretty wild. It's, um, it's pretty wild, Neptune's in Capricorn. So it's a very different flavor, right? Um, this chart in February 1990, um, a whole lot of Capricorn, just kind of a, um, a funny example of, of, of how many, how much Capricorn there were once you have those three outer planets and then you have these other moments where there was a lot of Capricorn. Um, I don't, the date's not exact on this, but this is just kind of throwing this out there. The first HTT P server was completed, which was really kind of a foundation of the coding and software that launched. Um, it was late December, 1990. And, um, and I couldn't find a date, but basically sometime in, in, in January of, of 91, we had this, the first web servers outside of the point, point of origin. So it was the start of the, the spread of this World Wide Web. Uh, it's an interesting chart. I, so I, I picked January 23rd um, just because it was a very interesting day and it was really close to when this happened. Um, wasn't able to research and get further into that. Uh, here's another chart that just has a ton of planets in Capricorn. Just to show you that, that happened. <laughs> um, January 13th, 93. We're on the, on the verge of the Neptune-Uranus conjunction. Uh, so, excuse me. And Neptune's sojourn through Capricorn, in Capricorn. The other thing um, about this, now that you have a little bit of, of, of a graphic and, and a run through of the, of the layout, the other thing to, th to keep in mind is that um, you know, we've got, we've got three planetary south nodes in Capricorn. So, so we're going to have these souls that have their Neptune conjunct these south nodes. And it's another layer or piece, a piece to this. Uh, and if you're familiar with the planetary south nodes, um, Jupiter has a pretty big swing from 30 Sag to 22 Cap on its south node, right? So um, that's a 10 year period there. 84 and 94, someone could have Neptune conjunct south node of Jupiter. Um, so that'd be something more to look at in an individual chart than talking about it generationally. But it, but it is part it is it is part of it, right? It's part of our experience of Capricorn right now because we all we all have these south nodes in Capricorn. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, not much, but a little bit later on. Um, the heliocentric south node of Jupiter is at 10 cap, so um, that would be 89 also, interesting. Uh, those born in 93 to 90, April 97, they could have Neptune conjunct the south node of Saturn. Uh, and this, this is a, a geocentric swing from 18 to 30 degrees cap. 
heliocentric south node of Saturn, 23 cap, 45. And you can see I list those, those dates in 95 there when that happened in conjunction. Uh, finally, south node of Pluto, it only swings from 19 to 22 degrees Capricorn, uh, small window of time. And actually, this is interesting that south nodes of Saturn and Pluto are conjunct at 19 cap uh, in September, October, and November of each year. So um, fall of 93 and fall of 94 in particular, Neptune is conjunct both south nodes of Saturn and Pluto together. Um, so before we get into the meanings of Neptune and Capricorn, I was going to go into some world events. Um, but actually, <laughs> say I drew a card, or I drew a couple of tarot cards to um, about the meaning of this generation. And then we'll jump back into some events, maybe, or some meaning. Uh, and I'm a little bit nervous about this, and, and I just wanted to be upfront and honest about that because um, I do feel like it's a little bit of a departure from a uh, standard approach to astrology to be drawing tarot cards here. Um, and uh, I put as above, so below on here because uh, for me, if we talk about astrology and we believe astrology is true, it's essentially saying that we believe that there's a holographic element of life in the universe as above, so below. And so if that is true, uh, how far do we go with that? You know, and some astrologers are um, you know, really into tarot, really into the universe revealing meanings in space all over, right? Anything and everything that there, there could be meaning found and, and clues and symbols, breadcrumbs to lead us back. Um, and so, so I did this thing where, I mean, I, I've been doing this, I'll draw a card for, for a reading a lot of times for somebody and I'll talk about the, what that means for them, not doing a full spread. Uh, and, I, and I do it for myself. Uh, and so I thought, why not uh, draw a card? or two for this generation and what would come out of that. So, <laughs> so yeah, the deck I'm using is the Herbal Tarot. I love the illustrations, Candace Canton and uh, books written by Michael, Michael Tierra, famous herbalist. First card I drew, King of Swords. There's an herb on each card. This is St. John's wort and it is the fire of air. There's the card. Uh, this is paraphrasing from Michael Tierra's interpretation. Uh, being a sword, this card represents the air element. However, the king sits on a rock, representing grounded in one's thoughts and awareness. There's a clearness of mind and ability to use analytical powers of the mind to see through to truth. There is a warning to not become too harsh and critical, needing to learn tolerance of mind and learning how to support oneself and others' creativity. My thoughts on this, that the generation comes in with a keen awareness of how reality works. Neptune, consciousness, awareness, Saturn, reality, Capricorn, Saturn. The generation, we may notice that there is a prevailing disinterest in politics uh, and, and the economy and the reality world. Um, and, um, and, I, and I believe that they can see the limitations of, of, of the ideals, right? There's an ideal of what things could be, Neptune and Capricorn, and then there's seeing, seeing what it is. So this card also then points to this awareness of corruption, the emptiness, the meaninglessness of modern culture. Uh, additionally, uh, this point may be, may be seen through the lens of, of, of nationalism, culture, and or racism. 
and and I want to get into that a little more. This will make sense. Um, and so if we can imagine that these things correlate to this generation, well, they probably do. And you might think I'm way out there right now, but just hold on. Uh, it might make more sense. So yeah, dissolve all barriers and walls and limitations. Oh, you know, the ideal of Neptune and Capricorn. Let's just, you know, like, let's break down these walls and ha have no separation, right? Um, or are we idealizing the borders of our nation and the barriers and the, and the separation that we have? What if there's a mix of both of these things going on in one's consciousness at the same time? What is that even like? I hadn't even really thought about that until now. Uh, and it's totally possible. And uh, it's probably a little confu confusing. Um, so if we start to consider these could be mixes, as part of the consciousness within the generation. It's, it's an interesting thought. Uh, and if that were true, what if you know some could be swayed by a very strong argument uh, regarding a certain perspective, a way of viewing reality? You know, unity versus separation is kind of this key that uh, I come to with this when, when you break it down at a dualistic level. And 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 where one in consciousness lands, right? Uh, as evolutionary astrologers, we know this is gonna be relative to the evolutionary state of their soul, the culture, the conditions they're born into, the nature of ego, other factors and conditions, right? And, and we'll talk a little bit about that, I think. Um, <laughs> King of Swords also raises the notion that this generation could become stuck at times in over, Criticalness and cynicism. Capricorn does correlate to judgment uh, relative to classic Neptunian disillusionment. So we could see that um, many may become um, stuck in this consciousness of futility in the face of what I'm just calling an inherited global, global crisis that impacts people individually today. Uh, so this, this card also speaks to something that this generation brings from the past. Um, and this is something that they come in with and it can help themselves, they can help those around them and they can help humanity. And I, and I believe that uh, there's this gift that they have um, and, it, and it's this potential of being very creative while working within the limitations that are presented. And you could see how that totally correlates to Neptune and Capricorn, right? Uh, and uh, I kind of call this their superpower, uh, and, and, and that they, they have yet to really manifest it. But uh, I think that's going to change. Uh, so I kind of throw out there, like, how, how do we honor this gift from this generation, and how, and how do we nurture um, their evolutionary process? So again, most of them have Pluto and Scorpio, and the true Pluto Scorpio fashion. Um, their souls have had and may have right now facing evolutionary necessity of what it means to be powerless on their journeys to become empowered. So it's a bit, it's a range, it's a big scale. It's in different ways in different parts of our lives. Right. Um, and so when we combine this with Neptune and Capricorn, other potential active planets in Capricorn, uh, right, then, then that, that emphasizes this Capricorn potential for, for, for complete futility in the face of powerlessness. This could be an uh, in, inner psychological loop. Uh, it's an identifiable aspect uh, within, within their own consciousness. Uh, and not saying that one does or doesn't sink into this depression, but it's there aware of it, uh, aware that there's a potential really dark place they could let themselves slip into. Uh, and being born into this reality uh, where local and global resources are becoming more finite with an expanding global population. Uh, these souls bringing a creativity and resource management at the exact team time that 
all life on earth needs it, you know? So, um, so we, we need their gift right now. It's my opinion. <laughs> Drawing this King of Swords for me brought my attention and emphasis on this gift. Um, and so I, I believe that we can support this generation by reminding them, they, reminding them of their gift and that, that we, we, we need them to, we need that what they have. Uh, and I, I, life on earth needs them too. It's just to keep trying, right? Uh, Capricorn determination to keep trying in the face when things look really bleak. And we really need to be open to and invite this generation to, to speak their ideas and, and their inspiration. They're really just getting started. King of Swords speaks to using the analytical mind to separate truth from webs of deception. This clarity of mind to see truth, it's gonna be more emphasized with these Sagittarius, Sagittarius weighted charts, right? So again, that the, in the sandwich, the, the early and the later part will have, will resonate even more with that, or if you have a lot of Sagittarius in your chart. Uh, this I found really fascinating uh, in regards to the spiritual properties of St. John's wort. This is why I love each, each card has a spiritual property, um, each, each herb. Michael Tierra writes, this herb can impart the capacity to calm the emotions of fear, depression, and frustration in order to allow our ability for free visionary thoughts to come through. So if you're part of the Neptune and Capricorn generation and listening to this, uh, consider that St. John's wort could be a key plant ally for you at, at crucial junctures. Uh, So yeah, I really believe that um, this is this is a message for the generation uh, that you know finding their tools and support and resources to calm the emotions. Uh, so yeah, frustration, limitation in reality, depression in the face of the dark side of the human experience, dominance and control over each other in nature fears of what we face. Uh, these are all very real emotions for this generation and, and, and these emotions um, have a potential to be crippling to creative potential. Um, you know, uh, how, how do we face the cumulative karma, collective karma, you know, stemming from these centuries leading up till right now? How do we face that? Uh, and how do we find this place of inner peace and happiness? Um, we can really be depressed every day if we want, <laughs> or if we don't want to, we can fall into it. It's true. Uh, we're, we, we, we do know where that path leads. And we don't know totally where it goes, but um, yeah. There's this, it's like a, I see this on a bumper sticker. If, you know, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. And I think something about that um, always kind of like some, something. There's something about that. I'm like, what? It, it's it's true that when you see what's going on, and if you if you just someone just responded completely emotionless to some horror of reality that's actually going on, you know, how are we even human, right? And yet, um, how can you walk around um, in that place all the time, right? How can, how, can, how, can you, how can you live like that all the time? Uh, there's, just, there's just so much going on and there's so much to be aware of. And, and it, you know, so if, if, if we're constantly learning and aware through social media, through media, through the news and, and how we're bombarded by all this information constantly, we can be so much more aware of, of the evils and injustice and oppression in the world and, and how do we return to this place of peace and happiness? And, and so yeah, this St. John's wort, um, to me, it's a reminder not, not to fall into this never ending pit of despair and sorrow, which, which is possible for this, for this generation. 
um, and that we can make this noble effort to achieve a state of mind where we allow our creativity and visionary thinking to flow. Um, we can sink into it or we can rise up. And that, that's really the two sides of the coin for Capricorn, determination on one and futility on the other, right? This generation's very aware of this inside themselves. Uh, so that you have the herb, this herb could assist. Um, and um, I believe it can be a great ally for, for depression and despair. Uh, of course, um, it's not an end all or anything, and, and it's a symbol and a metaphor for, for, for a medicine also. Um, and it's a reminder that we have allies, um, other allies in, in, the, in the plant kingdom, in the animal kingdom, uh, especially for this generation too, even thinking of the earth itself as an ally, um, the mountains speak to us, the rocks and the minerals. We have our ancestors, our spirit guides, we need to call on these people for help. Um, and you have the potential to create reality, um, potential on the opposite side to feel like you're a victim of reality. And reality can shape us, and it does. And, and we, sh we shape reality. So, um, you know, not to give up that power, that we also have a power to shape reality. Uh, and, and it's going to require a lot of ter great determination in the face of this bleakness. It's a prayer that in the face of aloneness, harshness, fear, and bitterness, may you find hope. May you see that there are whispers of love and support speaking through the universe to you, the dark matter, visible structure that holds all that is, has love in it. May this fill your cup. Second card I drew was the hermit. Licorice is the herb. Uh, astrological ruler is Virgo. Um, and immediately I, I got, even without reading about it, I got, you know, that this generation has a lot of old souls in it. <clears throat> that they've been through a lot. Um, what's going on in the drama of life right now is, is new, but uh, the stories and the motives are very old. It's a very familiar story in a lot of ways. Uh, and especially when you're gonna see charts for those in this generation that have this balsamic phase highlighted, Saturn balsamic to Neptune, Uranus balsamic to Neptune, other balsamic phases in there, this will be, aspect will be highlighted even more. Do a time check. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so um, Neptune conjunct the south nodes of Saturn and, and Pluto. Um, one thing that I think this does correlate to is there's a deep connection um, to the original path of separation that humanity took um, from where we were living in harmony with nature and the natural world. Um, and, and those of you who are familiar with Jeffrey Wolf Green's teachings on the planetary nodes may remember that he connects the south nodes of, of Pluto and Saturn in Capricorn to the start of patriarchal cultures beginning to rule by fear and destruction, uh, distortion of Capricorn into the expressions of hierarchy, dominance, control, oppression, and enslavement. Uh, and so, so yeah, we're talking about having this com connections to some really deep, heavy stuff from the past. Um, the hermit realizes that the truth one seeks lies within, not without. I think that's really key when you tie this into the other the meaning of the other card. Uh, so. To me, this card speaks that this Neptune and Capricorn generation 
uh, has potential to play a very key role in bringing spiritual, uh, spirituality back into our consensus reality. Materialism is full grown. <laughs> it's part of our ma mainstream. I mean, it's kind of beyond Western culture. It's, you know, globally spreading. Um, and it also comes with um, a great void, spiritual emptiness. Uh, and, I, and I believe that this generation knows that this type of culture doesn't give them the, the nourishment that they need. Um, and th that they may, you know, be part of the spiritual evolution because they're going to teach by example, um, the, looking within themselves for what they seek. Um, it's only like, you know, a little bit of this generation has gone past their first Saturn return. So, so this gift that they have for humanity is really going to become increasingly evident as we proceed. How, it's just kind of starting to come out, right? Uh, this, the, the herb licorice is an ally to this generation. Licorice has this capacity to um, bring inner peace and harmonize different parts of ourselves. Uh, and so um, to gain that clarity, um, licorice kind of can pave the way a little bit, and create, create a calm in the mind, can, can harmonize parts of ourselves and, you know, and, and it's not like um, in, in allopathic medicine, the Western world, we're, we're really taught to get rid of the symptom. And so if depression is the symptom. It's like, well, take this pill, and you're gonna get rid of your depression. And, and I know Jeff Green would talk about this a lot. And I really appreciated it because basically in, in, in Jeff's teaching, depression is a natural function and that unless you have a, a situation where there's chronic depression, depression um, in general is natural and it's not something to get rid of. Um, and so if there's part of ourselves that, that we identify with or we notice that goes to this place of depression, we don't really need to get rid of that part of ourselves. Um, so, we can harmonize that part of ourselves with all the other weird, random, crazy parts of, of who we are. <laughs> uh, many parts to the psyche and personality. Uh, we will see it, we can see it come up like, oh, there's that part of me that could just be completely depressed and really negative about everything right now. And, and we can see that, and, but we can also to acknowledge it as one of our teachers as our emotions can teach us. So um, even if you don't use the licorice, um, just thinking about this concept that it could be an herb that can support this challenging task of harmonizing these pieces of ourselves. Um, I, didn't, I didn't know this, but Michael Tierra wrote about how the, the herbs were then used to prepare for a state of meditation, create a calmness and, and harmonizing. And that, and so I, I do believe for this generation that harmonizing the, the consciousness is a really uh, something of great value. Um, whether you're actually talking about doing this for a meditation or uh, that you just want to keep an inner peace and balance as you, as you, you go into your day. Uh, it's also, um, it's, it's really common in Chinese herb formulas because it, at least this is my understanding of it. I'm not, I don't have a lot of experience, but that it's a harmonizing element. So it can take other herbs that are doing things and help them work together, right? Um, I'm gonna jump back to a little bit of the evolutionary astrology basics and uh, I've got 15 minutes, so okay. I'll go quick. <laughs> Cause I do have a few charts and things to share. Um, right, Neptune, consciousness itself. Um, the invisible element of all life that interconnects everything. Uh, Neptune also correlates with what holds ultimate meaning in consciousness. And obviously I alluded to this earlier on, what holds ultimate meaning in consciousness if somebody has Neptune and Capricorn? Uh, and I really 
there's the whole like dissolving all the barriers, we're all one. Uh, but I do think that's a little bit of a rose colored glasses because um, there's also, you know, idealizing capitalism, <laughs> which is very different. Uh, so I did want to um, just kind of jump back to the journey through the zodiac as an archetypal journey. And most of us who are familiar with astrology are familiar that the bottom, the bottom first um, half is an individual evolutionary experience. And then the second top half, six through 12 or seven through 12, uh, Libra through Pisces is uh, a social collective evolutionary experience. And so yeah, Aries starts off the process of the individual process of evolution and self-discovery, which in a way kind of culminates at Leo because in Virgo, it's a transitionary phase and we're preparing, we're preparing to enter the social sphere. And at the point that we enter this uh, upper half and go into the social sphere, um, it's a very key point because it's the, it's, well, it's opposite the start, but it's the start of the second half. So it is a beginning, right? And what, what begins there, whether it's equality or inequality, um, right? It, it, that rises then through and continues to evolve and develop. So by the time we reach Capricorn, what's taken very clear form and structure is stemming from the equality or inequality that at, the, at the Libra point. And in a, if we want to really change society, we can really also look at the first social experiences and the conditions we meet socially. And of course, yes, uh, real change starts with home, Cancer fourth and its polarity to Capricorn. Uh, but point being is that, um, you know, we live in a world where, where, where things are unfair. And so we're, we're inheriting uh, collective karma, as well as our individual karma, and all the conditions of, of a cumulative of collective experience of humanity. Uh, and, and relative to uh, a capitalistic economic model, right, um, we're taught to gain at the expense of others, to rise to the top, benefiting individually from inequality and oppression. Uh, so these, these, this is just being modeled as success. Um, so yeah, what, what, if, what, if, what if we're nurtured that, that, that this is good, it's great, that capitalism is the ideal economic model. And this is where, to me, it makes sense to bring in the evolutionary stages of the soul. And I noticed that, um, of, to me, and this is just my opinion, Jeffrey Wolf Green's teachings, um, it seems one of the less popular ones that's talked about, and I, I hardly ever hear it spoken about uh, at conferences or, or, or uh, in general, a lot, a lot of people just leave, leave the stages out, evolutionary stages of the soul. Uh, so, uh, but if we look at the Neptune and Capricorn generation and we wanna understand why some of these souls fully reject reality that they're seeing and they are so unengaged in, in, in the politics. But then we find that some of them are, are, are you know, zealous nationalists, uh, right? Um, this, is, this, this, this is where I go, it is looking at evolutionary stages. Uh, so, um, you know, and, and the, reason, the reason is, um, if we think about the evolutionary stages, if, um, we're taught that three, three fourths roughly of, of all souls are in a consensus evolutionary stage. There's nothing wrong with this, but if you're in the consensus evolutionary stage, your soul is evolving through the culture that you're born into through that experience. Um, and so we could even go so far just to say that a lot of the Neptunian idealization for a majority um, becomes the mainstream culture. Um, 
and I don't think that we want to think about that, but I'm kind of wondering how, to what extent this is true. Uh, just throw it all out there. Um, so, and, and so we have this kind of clash within the generation of souls that are really rebelling from all of this. And, and then we have some that are really embracing different view of reality. Uh, this Uranian element, that's what it's like, they're, they're, looking around, they're looking around and like, what is going on? Are these people for real? And they're, they're our peers. Uh, so this Uranus and Cap and for seven years, right? So that's, yeah, there's a lot of souls here that, that they're, they're gonna shake things up big time. No doubt, no doubt. Um, and yes, of course, Uranus, liberate from these, the existing social, political, economic institutions, structures, change it, right? It's just um, Neptunian disillusionment, you know, with, with this norm, right? Combined with, with, with the rebelling. Uh, and I don't, I'm not even sure what this means, but I think they swallowed the blue pill and the red pill. <laughs> they, they're, you know, uh, and of course, Uranus correlates with trauma. So we're also talking about within this generation, especially with this Uranus-Neptune conjunction, um, souls who have been in individuating and and for the individuating evolutionary stage souls, and you know, obviously, like they're not accepting the conditions of of the norm from the past, and then have undergone trauma from authority, right? Capricorn as a result. Um, and so you, you could have, some, we could see some pretty intense um, issues with authority in this generation um, and not fitting in socially, uh, you know, outcasts, misfits. Um, there's, so, there's so many different things, right? Um, that, that, that can be part of these symbols. Um, but I, I do feel that I feel really strongly that there's there's a very strong disenchantment is 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 the word I'm using with with politics and the way the ways things are run right now and that that's that's going to be really interesting to see how that unfolds um, and this other side of it um, I the side that's idealizing mainstream culture I I don't I don't even know yet. Um, <laughs> Um, so I'm jumping, I'm jumping ahead because I'm running out of time, but, um, <laughs> uh, spiritual constipation. Um, <laughs> okay. Oh, um, uh, Bradley, no yes. need to rush. Um, it's open-ended. This is the last meeting of the day. So yeah, figured awesome. Thanks for that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So I did touch on the powerlessness piece with the Pluto and Scorpio generation. Um, so um, with Neptune and Capricorn, this piece about um, you know becoming a victim of, of those who maintain you know authority, right? So so I think there's a potential in the generation that we we could see a victim consciousness orientation, something to be aware of. Uh, and that residing in that victim consciousness can be a place where we could see them get stuck. And, um, you know, on, on, the, on the flip side, there's also souls in this generation who had power and control over groups. <laughs> so, um, and, and there's souls who have played both sides, you know, and, and have that awareness of, of, and this is what I'm talking about, that old souls piece. Uh, deep, deeper wisdom of both sides of the human drama. Uh, oh, guilt and shame, uh, wonderful Capricorn traits. Uh, so yeah, those in this generation who have um, abused their own power in the past, they may come into this and it may be far in the past. Um, there could be like a, 
conjunction to planetary south node or something, or um, it could show up in a lot of ways uh, in the chart, different ways, but um, that that's definitely one of the ways that I've seen it show up, conjunctions to that uh, Saturn-Pluto south node. Con so yeah, they're coming in with a weight of uh, past guilt and shame. So, some, some of them do have this and, and they may not really be able to explain it according to the current circumstances of their lives. Uh, but now imagine that, but it's someone who's in a consensus evolutionary stage. So, so, there's, so that their soul's looking for is in, in, in the mainstream culture. And so what does consensus culture offer Right, uh, so we could imagine that actually this could be someone who gravitates towards Christianity and the cross, uh, Jesus washing away their guilt from from their past, bringing that Uranus liberation that that their soul seeks, um, and they may even become very fanatical about this, and and maybe you've seen some of these souls. And, and so this is another possible manifestation uh, of, of the correlation to, to this symbol. <clears throat> and so I, I'm raising that question, like does Neptune and Capricorn correlate to idealizing rigidity, I'm thinking? <laughs> or does it correlate to dissolving limited thinking? Or, you know, is it both? Uh, on Earth, I, I kind of think it's, it's a mixed bag here, it's, you know. <laughs> so, um, so just a question, just to put out there. Will, will the maturing of this generation of Neptune and Capricorn, will it shape and change and transform reality that we live in as much as the emergence of the World Wide Web did, which began? Um, you know, basically at that Uranus-Neptune conjunction, because uh, obviously that's changed the world greatly. And, and so it's like, how much is this generation gonna change the world? We don't really know yet. Um, it's kind of a side shoot here, but obviously Cancer Capricorn axes um, correlates with gender, gender conditioning, gender assigning. And so this whole idea that um, this generation is like, gone way beyond the box of, of gender. The box has been exploded and dissolved and it's not even there. Um, and so we're seeing into the mainstream culture now um, a w an increasing awareness uh, of, of what gender does and doesn't mean and how diverse that is. And this generation is a big part of that. Uh, so, what was going on in the world when Neptune was in Capricorn? Um, this is like barely going to scratch the surface. And I mean, honestly, we we could we could spend a long, long time about this. Um, the first thing I was like, well, <laughs> that song "We Are the World" uh, that was really powerful. It was huge. It was like one of the biggest singles to go global. Uh, and I mean, that was right after Neptune went in Capricorn. Uh, but definitely has that spirit of unity of going, you know, Neptune beyond through all boundaries, um, space and time separating us. Uh, but, so Neptune first went in in January 18th, 1984. I thought this was interesting that the um, January 24th, 84, Steve Jobs introduces the first Macintosh computer because uh, what we're going to see is that there's just this, obviously, with the internet and the World Wide Web, that was another, there's this whole thread of technology with Neptune and Capricorn. Also, 85, we discover there's a hole in the ozone layer. Uh, just seems very Neptune and Capricorn. Um, and what I, the mid-80s was just like, music was exploding with, with, new styles and genres were forming that didn't even exist. I mean, it was just, it was just nuts, you know. Um, 
so um, for me, the what's interesting that you know, like eighty nine to ninety three is really just like this very pivotal period for and and, and within this generation. I was just looking in that the the first smartphone came out in about ninety three. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Uh, the uh, I, I'm big fan of the Los Angeles underground hip hop scene, which it's often not that recognized and acknowledged as other music movements have been during the era, whether you're talking about alternative grunge, punk, or uh, electronica, you know, there, there were so many, so many movements, but it, it, it was just as influential as a music movement and it did spread all the way across the globe, uh, you know, at a grassroots level. And, and that really began with this open mic a hip hop venue at, at the Good Life Cafe in South Central LA starting in December 89. And, you know, and by 93, it had already uh, spread across the globe. Uh, if anyone's interested, there's a documentary called This Is The Life, which uh, tells this story beautifully. It's also on Netflix. Uh, November 9th, 1989, Fall of the Berlin Wall, classic, right? I mean, how how more of a perfect symbol can we can we have, right, for this? And if you look at that chart, we have um, Saturn and Neptune in a very very close conjunction. That's thirteen minutes away. Um, so that's one of those 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 feel good. I remember that very very clearly coming on the news growing up. It was such a an emotion behind it. Uh, it's really powerful, really powerful time, and um, that's all. That's that's all I got for today. So uh, I just wanted to open it up, and uh, if anyone does want to give some comments or questions, or uh, um, let's see, I'm gonna I'm gonna unshare my screen. Yeah, just click on stop share at the top of the screen, the red one. Oh, there we go. I got it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any questions or comments? I loved it. It was great. I absolutely loved it. Just like I loved all your presentations. It was fantastic. Okay. Um, you're not of that generation, though, are you? No, I'm in from the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, That's I didn't I think so. Yeah. Oh, we do have volunteers in our group who have all those, um, you know, planets in Capricorn, those huge stellions in Capricorn. Mm. Okay. Any final questions? Wanda, go ahead. I just had a thought. Do um, you think this kind of cor uh, corresponds with the also the rise of the uh, the evangelical, you know, where, because um, I've heard a lot really since the 90s about, you know, God has ordained this, you know, particular government, whatever gets, whoever gets, you know, elected besides probably the last president um, here in the U.S., but you've heard a lot of that God ordained the government. So that, that's... Mm. Uh, I was kind of correlating that with, you know, the Neptune God and government uh, Capricorn and the, you know, Uranus of, because um, you, you, you have that element of wanting to rebel by going back to the past, you know, and, and Jeffrey Green has definitely um, talked about that with Uranus. Yeah, I, you're, you're totally right on with that. And right, that's, Yep. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's fascinating. There, I know there were so many. Um, so, someone was just telling me something, and I was like, "Ah, oh, that's another one." <laughs> you know, that totally that makes sense. It seems to me from from a lot of these uh, people that are in the generation that I know of um, that definitely are rebelling. You know, rebelling against that. And um, the older generation 
you know, getting mad because they're rebelling against. <laughs> kind of a, almost like a vicious cycle. Okay, looks like that's the end of your meeting. Well, thank you very much from all of us. Looking forward to seeing you next time. Would you all thank please you so thank much. Bradley Narrigan, everyone. Thank you. Brilliant as always. Thank you. Thank Good luck to chew on. <laughs> My kids are millennial. Thank <laughs> you.